Good morning. This is the March 28th meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek. This me meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the internet. If you do not want to be a YouTube star, sit in one of the last three rows and you won't be recorded. Paulette, can you call the roll, please? Kelso. Here. Birdsall. Here. Pyatt. Here. Neff. Here. Adams. Here. Anderson. Here. Brown. Here. Kooten. Here. Roth. Here. O'Keefe. Here. Approval of the minutes. You've all read the minutes, I know, so are there any corrections or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, they're approved as written. Treasurer's report, please. Good morning, everyone. Today's Treasurer's report summarizes February's financial results for both the operating budget and the GRF trust estate fund. I'll also provide year-to-date data, but I'm gonna digress for a minute because I wanna answer a question asked of me by several residents and committee members. That is, how do I access the GRF agenda packages and the treasurer's detailed report? So the easy way is to look for the board agenda column on page 8A in yesterday's Rossmore News. The first paragraph of the column provides a direct link to the new software called Simply, where GRF board and committee meeting agendas and attachments are stored. And in addition to the treasurer's report, all of the attachments that the board sees, residents are able to see. And now for a longer second approach that has four steps. Access Rossmore.com on the internet where you will see Rossmore's homepage. Go to the bottom of the homepage and click on Golden Rain Foundation. And a nice picture of Bob Kelso appears along with various information. At the bottom of the page is a clickable web link entitled Recent and Upcoming Agenda and Minutes. After clicking on this web link, you will be taken to the GRF Board and GRF Committee Meeting website. A page appears with a list of board and committee meeting dates. Select the board meeting you want to view for the meeting, from the meeting title list. So for day, today, that would be the 3-28-2019 meeting. And if you want the detailed financial reports for the first time ever, we've started to post those on the Finance Committee link uh, under the agenda. And by the way, if you are a person who wants to view the detailed financial reports, I'd like to meet you. We are always looking for talented volunteers. So now, thanks for the digression, um, and I've told you how you can find detail. I want to give the treasurer's report for the month. For the month of February, the GRF operating budget had a $12,000 surplus. Revenues were $46,000 under budget, and expenses were $58,000 under budget. Cumulative for the first two months of the year, the operating budget has a deficit of $9,000. Revenues are $86,000 below budget, and expenses are $77,000 below budget. And again, the detail of the variances are in the treasurer's report in the board package. Now let's review the results of the trust estate fund, beginning with the revenue generated by the membership transfer fee, also referred to as the MTF. I mentioned last month that the revenue from the MTF decreased significantly in December 2018 and January 2019. The same is true for February 2019. There were 23 membership fees con collected in February, generating $207,000. That compares to 37 in February 2018 that generated $333,000. Cumulative for the first two months of the year, 45 fees have been collected, generating $405,000. That compares to 70 fees for the same period in 2018, which generated $630,000. Total trust fund expenditures in February were $244,000 and included $21,000 for water reclamation facility study, $18,000 for machinery and equipment, $15,000 for Tice Creek repairs, and $182,000 for debt service on the three GRF loans. The month-end cash balance for the fund 
is two million nine hundred and five thousand dollars. Does the board have any questions? Thank you. Tim, the CEO's report. Good morning, board members, residents, and staff. Um, I reported on this last month. It, it occurred after the February CEO report in the newspaper, but I reported it here at, that, at, at last month's meeting, so I'm going to restate it because we put it in the paper for yesterday. And that is that the KQED radio feature in the Comcast Xfinity um, has been added back. Um, if you recall that Comcast removed the um, FM radio stations from their TV package, and it caused a lot of people to be very, very upset about that. And it wasn't just for Rossmore, they removed it for everyone in the Western United States. They have, due to the lobbying that we did with um, uh, the Comcast local people and Comcast national people, uh, and the um, influence that I think a lot of our residents had on Comcast, they heard and they restored KQED. So KQED is still available on your TV. That's the KQED radio station as well as uh, KQED TV station. Um, however, the other FM stations are not available. There are other music stations available through your TV on Comcast, um, but they are not KDFC, KJAZZ, any of the stations that a lot of people used to listen to because radio reception over the air is not good in the Rossmore Valley. Uh, they will not be restoring those. They only restored KQED. They only did it for us. They did not do it and restore it for anybody else in, uh, in their service area. So we'll, we will have it until the equipment wears out. The reason they made this change was they, tell, they told us was because the technology, the equipment uh, is not compatible any longer with the, the analog signals are not compatible with digital signals. They don't have equipment that can, um, they can continue to get and purchase to, to make that system work. That's their story. So we are um, grateful that they restored the channel. Um, KQED is the number one radio station in the Bay Area and, and there's nothing else like it on the radio. So that's I think why a lot of residents were really concerned to lose it. So we're happy that it's back. Wanted to provide an update on the solar farm. Um, it, we are now uh, well over two years since we signed the agreement. It's, uh, let's see, 26 months, I think, now. Um, and there are still delays. So the latest delay, which I reported last month, but there is some movement here, so that's what I wanted to update you on. Uh, in January, the Contra Costa Fire Protection District was really the last hurdle that our um, solar operator needed to overcome. And um, the fire department um, has a new regulation that mandates that any structures that are over 5,000 square feet have to be sprinklered. Now, there's nothing combustible in a solar installation, but that's still the requirement. So uh, the new requirement. Uh, we, we, I appealed to Supervisor Candace Anderson, the county supervisor, who also serves on the Fire Protection District Board. Um, I didn't really get anywhere with that, but um, we did get some movement right after that from the um, uh, Deputy Fire Marshal who verbally made an accommodation, which if we can um, redesign the structure so that there is at least a 10-foot gap between each structure, then sprinklers will not be required. So the, the um, architect, the designer, the solar installer is going back to the drawing board. They have to resubmit permits back to the city, back to the fire department. So the process will continue. Um, we are hopeful that this can move a little quicker now, that there seems to be an accommodation. Um, I think we're tentatively looking at a, I'm looking at Jeff Matheson, we're, I think we're tentatively looking at a, hopefully a summer installation is kind of what's on the docket right now. Um, so that's the solar update. At last month's board meeting, following last month's board meeting, um, I should say during the board meeting, the board discussed the capital projects for 27, uh, 2019. The, um, there were 17 capital projects that were submitted, and there were three what were called and defined as other projects. The three other projects caused great confusion. Our intrepid Rossmore News reporters even got it wrong. The board members, some of the board members even misunderstood what action they actually approved, and when we went back and watched the videotape, 
of the meeting, it was clear that it was not clear, that it was ambiguous. So um, in, in the, how the, the motion was worded. So what the intent of the board was last month, and we're gonna go into this in a few minutes, um, intent of the board last month was the four officers and the planning committee had, in, had asked that three, these other projects, large other projects that were not being, we were not seeking approval on yet because they're not fully developed proposals yet. But because these are very large projects, uh, the, the officers and the planning committee agreed that they should be included in the mix of um, projects that you were ranking in addition to the 17 capital projects. So when we went through the ranking process last month, they were included. So you had the 17 capital projects and then three other projects, which total of 20 projects. The misunderstanding was that those three other projects were among the five highest ranked projects. And so some board members told me afterwards they thought they approved us moving forward with those projects. We did not approve moving forward with that project. That was not the intention at the meeting last month. So what the board intended was to approve seven of the capital projects, defer 10 till at least July and then reevaluate, and the other three, this, these three quote other projects, which was water reclamation, the gateway studios, and the creek uh, repair, um, that we would come back with to you with those at a later date once those are more fully developed. So we will fix all of that confusion. Newspaper understandably got it wrong. Some of the board members misunderstood. Residents in the community were confused as to what was approved. So we, this needs to be fixed. It was one point, it was $1,529,000 that you approved last month, but the actual motion didn't approve that. The motion actually said to defer the other items to the summertime. So it was just, it was an awkward wording of the motion. We just need to fix all of that so that's clear for the community what the board has authorized. So we'll do that later this morning. Um, I wanted to um, reference something that really affects the mutuals more than it does Golden Rain, but uh, it affects literally just about everybody in Rossmore. So I think it's appropriate for me to reference this. So um, a few years ago, the state of California mandated that every city um, reduce landfill volume by a certain percent. And um, two years ago, uh, the city met with me along with Recycle Smart and Republic Services, which is the uh, city's recycle franchiser and the actual operator who delivers the services. And they told me two years ago that Rossmore is not doing enough to uh, help the city meet its mandatory um, recycling obligations. So, um, so we have helped facilitate with the mutuals um, additional um, recycling opportunities. Mutuals can save money by downsizing their landfill bin, by reducing the size of that, and installing a recycle bin. You actually save money if you do that. And so many mutuals have done that. Republic has gone out and evaluated every trash enclosure in Rossmore. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. They've gone and looked at every single one of them, whether they can downsize, whether they can accommodate a, um, uh, um, a recycle cart or bin. And now they're exploring whether to accommodate um, organic recycling. So what's gonna happen next month for most of the mutuals is they're moving in April towards organic recycling. And organic recycling, what is that? That's, that's food would be the most um, common thing and food scraps and, and uh, let's say napkins that have food soil on them or pizza boxes, anything like that. All of that can go into the organic bin. So that's being rolled out in most of the mutuals next month. So, um, I'd like to ask all the residents to follow the instructions in the newspaper carefully. Um, the, the thing with organic and uh, other types of recycling is that if there's contamination in that recycling bin, 100% of everything in that bin then has to go to the landfill. So it's really important that if we're, gonna, if we're doing land, um, recycling, which is a mandate by the state, um, that we do it right. And so I'd like to really encourage everybody to do their best at, at um, participating in the program, 
um, putting the right things in the right containers, whether it's uh, organic recycling or whether it's plastics and paper, they go in a different type of a bin or whether it goes into the landfill. So that, that is coming. I, you know, this is good for Rossmore. It helps the city meet its mandatory obligations. Um, it's good for our environment. It helps improve our food quality, air quality, soil quality. Um, and we're all in this together. So um, I just uh, encourage everybody to participate as diligently as you can in the recycle program. I also wanted to comment on some uh, troubling comments that I heard in the last uh, week and a half or so. And apparently, this isn't isolated. Apparently, this is, um, th there's some rumors that have been floating around the community that I think bear um, discussion. And that is, um, I'm gonna quote, a resident or a group of residents have been propagating that there is a $1,000 increase coming in the coupon due to increases in the insurance rates. And that is, I wanna make sure everybody realizes that that is absolutely false, it is not true. There is no mutual, nor is Golden Rain, increasing uh, the coupon uh, with a special assessment or anything else due to the insurance increase. Mm -hmm. Insurance rates went up a lot. They went up 46%. That's a huge increase this year. Um, and it really kind of came in at the last minute. We were anticipating initially budgeting a 20% increase, but a whole confluence of factors have affected this. It is not just the losses experienced in Rossmore, but they are important. We had, a Mutual 68 had the landslide, and two homes were, were um, bulldozed. And, and the, the mediation, remediation that the mutual has undertaken to shore up that hillside, the total loss is around $6 million. That, that's all being covered by insurance. Um, and the project is not finished yet. So that's one significant loss that Rossmore has incurred on our valley-wide insurance policy. Another significant loss was in September of 2017 when there was the fire on Rossmore Parkway in Mutual 3. Um, and it destroyed four homes. Um, a very, very significant multi-million dollar loss that is currently in the process of the buildings are being reconstructed. There was another fire last year. It was, uh, I believe it was also in Third Walnut Creek Mutual. And it was on a back, um, uh, deck, my understanding, from a cigarette that was placed in a paper bag that ignited and then caught the deck on fire that it damaged uh, three units, one unit significantly. So we have those three very significant claims that have occurred in Rossmore. And if there was nothing else, environmentally or outside of Rossmore, we still would have had an increase, although it wouldn't have been 46%. But what you all know, what everybody knows, is the fires that have occurred in Northern California this year, or I should say in 2018, in Paradise, and other fires throughout Northern California. The previous year in Napa, in Southern California, the Mendocino Complex fire, the Redding fire, there's been a whole bunch of them. So the insurance industry has experienced mega losses in the multi, multi-billion dollar range just in California. Then you have hurricanes, we have floods, you have earthquakes that are not just national, but international. Our insurance program is underwritten by international um, under, underwriting. Um, so there's uh, Lloyds of London and lots of other entities are providing the insurance coverages of various different layers here for the Rossmore community. So they take all of that into consideration when they factor what the insurance pricing is going to be. And these, these massive losses in California have not helped. And then certainly when you get down into our community here, we've had our own share of losses. So all of that together added up to the 46% increase in the premium. And that was on top of an increase the previous year as well. Um, so having said all of that, no, Golden Rain, nor the mutuals, there wasn't a single mutual that implemented a special assessment and there's nobody contemplating a $1,000 assessment to cover the insurance. So I wanna make sure that that's clear, that this, this rumor has to stop. So I'm asking people to, if you have questions about this, come and see me or um, talk to Rick Chakoff, who is our uh, chief financial officer who handles the insurance here for Rossmore. Um, the other rumor that has been propagating, um, I also need to address. Somebody made a statement, let me make sure I quote it correctly. This is a quote. 
Rossmore is trying to price out elders to get a younger group of residents in here. That is a rumor that has been propagating as well by multiple people. Um, and so it's come back to me um, because people were concerned, people were frightened by these comments. Um, a family was considering moving because they thought that they're, uh, they were gonna move their parents out of here because they thought that Rossmore was pushing older people out. Nothing can be further from the truth. First of all, there, there is nobody in Rossmore has influence over housing prices. You all, everybody here on this board knows that. I wanna make sure, and I'm sure most of the people here in this room know that. Um, I think most residents understand that. The, the transactions in a buy-sell transaction are purely between the buyer and the seller and their representatives. Rossmore, Golden Rain Foundation, the mutuals have no hand in that, um, other than helping to keep the amenities nice and the community looking good and running good. That has a, 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 an influence, I'm sure, on real estate prices. But there is nobody in Golden Rain Foundation, on staff, on the board, on committees or in mutuals that is are drive, intentionally driving up prices to drive people out of here. That is not happening. That rumor has to stop as well. And, and I did some research. I, I, um, this question has come up before, or this claim has come up before. Um, and I did a little research when I put this report together. Uh, I went on to realtor.com, which anybody can access. Um, last week on March 21st, there were 18 houses for sale in Walnut Creek below $350,000. Half of those were in Rossmore. And then I went to 300,000. There are three houses in the entire city of Walnut Creek priced below 300,000 and all of them are in Rossmore. Then I went outside of Walnut Creek and I looked at how many homes are for sale below 600,000 in Arinda, Moraga, Lafayette and Danville. There are exactly zero homes for sale in those communities below 600,000. But guess how many homes we have in Rossmore below 600,000? There's 53, and that was on March 21st. When I looked at it last night, we're up to 56 properties below $600,000 in Rossmore. It is, it is by far the best value, housing value of anywhere in this area, and I would argue it's the best value of any community this close to San Francisco. Everything west of us, with the exception of some pockets of Oakland, are considerably higher in price than what we have here. So while prices have gone up for people that are buying into Rossmore, and those that have, are selling are getting this great return on their investment, um, or their housing if they've moved out of Rossmore, um, the, we are not immune to the prices going up. As long as Rossmore continues to be a great value, that will, relative to outside of Rossmore, that will continue to put upward pressure on prices here. So it's, it's probable that this run will continue for a little while longer. So um, I, I wanted to just, I need, this needed to clear up because these rumors have to stop. It's, it's hurtful, it's frightening to some people, and it needs to end. <clears throat> I wanted to do a, a little plug here for, um, first I needed to update you on something that's not even in your report, because this was in the newspaper yesterday. The, um, we've had great difficulty hiring lifeguards. That's not an uncommon problem. We have this problem every year at this time of the year because the um, high schools are still in school until June. It's very difficult for us to hire lifeguards anyway, but it's m most difficult between March and, and June. It is such a crisis. We've been working our employees seven days a week. All, almost all of them are working overtime. That's not sustainable. We can't continue to do that. We have a real critical need for lifeguards, and we can't. We're doing everything we can. We've approached all the swim clubs. We've approached swim coaches. We've approached the high schools, the co local colleges. Uh, this is running on all kinds of job boards everywhere. We are not getting applicants for the job. So we announced in the newspaper yesterday that we're gonna to have to alternate the closure of the hillside and dollar swimming pools um, until we can get the staffing up. We, we've been trying for months, we're just not having any success. We are now paying more uh, uh, at an hourly rate than the, than the uh, public swimming pools, um, lifeguard rates still can't attract anybody. So um, probably will clear itself up by June and hopefully sooner than that, but I wanted to make sure people are aware that that's an I a real issue. We apologize for having to do this. We don't really have any other alternative. We have to still uh, make these safe environments for people to swim and enjoy the swimming pools. 
along with that, um, as, as the board I, I know knows, we've, and everybody knows, we've had a lot of rain. We've had, all, I think, near record rain between December and March of this year, um, which is great. I love the rain, so it doesn't bother me one bit, but it doesn't do real well for our golf revenue. Um, our golf revenue is way, way down, um, and that does have an impact because um, if we don't raise the revenue that we expect, that there's an impact then on the coupon. So while, the weather, while we're still waiting for the rain to end, I looked at the forecast this morning. It's uh, supposed to be nice this weekend. In fact, it's supposed to be spectacular this weekend, but rain is in the forecast for Monday. So I don't think we're out of the woods yet on the rain. In the interim, I'd like to ask the community to consider shopping at the, at the pro shop, um, at, uh, at our pro shop here. It's, we've got great clothing, very comfortable clothing with Rossmore gear and letterhead, logos, whatever. Um, it's, uh, people like it. Um, I think people are proud to live here in Rossmore. There's all kinds of little doodads and knickknacks that they sell down there. And the best part is that here you're gonna promote Rossmore and you don't have to be a golfer to go into the pro shop, um, but the profits are turned back to the community in the form of a reduced coupon. So that can help us get through this time where, where all of our sales revenues are way, way down with golf, anything associated with golf. And the other thing I'd like to ask people to consider is that if you have always wanted to take up the game of golf, now is the time to do it. Um, uh, <clears throat> we have instructors that are happy to show you how to play golf. And those of you that are already golfing, this is a great time to take a lesson while you're, I know you're itching to get back on the golf course and enjoy the game. While we're waiting for the course to dry out, consider taking a lesson. And uh, all of that will help ultimately the bottom line of the Golden Rain Foundation, which is all of you and, and a benefit to the community. So, um, and on top of that, then you get to enjoy the game of golf and probably meet new friends and, prob and play on two of the best courses in the East Bay. So I um, encourage people to take a, take a look at the golf uh, pro shop and consider taking a lesson. And finally, I have some in, um, employee transitions. In February, we had three employees begin their employment with Golden Rain. Kaya Brown, who's a new uh, events assistant with the recreation department, and Marta uh, Padilla, who is a new reservations coordinator at, at uh, the Gateway Clubhouse. Uh, Dan Rosenstrock, who I saw taking photographs here. Dan is here in the back. He's our um, new photographer. If you haven't met Dan, make sure you meet him. He's, um, I, thought it, I like his style of photography in the newspaper. I think it's, it's super nice. Um, so welcome, Dan. And then we had six employees leave employment with Golden Rain in February. Uh, Daniel Alfaro, a plumber in our maintenance department. Matthew uh, Jerahan, an equipment operator with the golf course crew. Rufina Flores and Josephine House were both news carriers. Uh, Maureen O'Rourke, our longtime director of communications, uh, she retired last month. Jacob Wraith, a lifeguard with our aquatics department, and Victor Ting, a videographer, all have left Golden Rain this month, and that's my report. Thank you, Tim. Before we get to the residence forum, I would like to make a couple comments myself um, about the rumor about uh, pricing people out of Rossmore, I think that probably also pertains to concerns about the coupon. And I just want to reiterate that everyone on the board is very concerned about the coupon increases. Uh, we try our best to look at that during our two-day budget session in September. Uh, I think the record is that we've uh, increased the coupon for GRF. Now, this isn't the mutual part of the coupon, less than the rate of inflation over the last five or ten years, but I urge you to come to those meetings and to participate and give your comments um, uh, about those. And as far as uh, rumors, uh, there seemed to be uh, quite a bit of confusion about what we approved last month about the uh, Comcast uh, task force or uh, ad hoc committee. Our uh, uh, contract is coming up in 2021, and so it's our duty to uh, survey the uh, the residents of Rossmore, find out what their uh, problems have been with Comcast, if any, find out what, if any, services they'd like to see increased, look at alternatives to see if people are using the services that uh, we're paying for every month, uh, $55. And so all we approved was the formation of a committee to do a survey of the community so that we are in a position when we negotiate with Comcast uh, to have information about what the residents really want. So. There's no plan to get rid of Comcast at this point. It's just uh, to survey the uh, residents to find out uh, what their experience has been with Comcast and, and how happy or 
unhappy they are with Comcast. So now the Residence Forum, Jerry. Okay, the Residence Forum this morning will involve six speakers, and we ask that you assemble over by the podium, and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, you should start by giving your name and your address, and that's to assist the board members to know who within their district is uh, motivated to speak at the residence forum. Um, the first couple of speakers are Richard McPherson, Joe John Allo, and Sally Kirby. If you have any written materials, you can give them to the secretary at the conclusion of your remarks. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard McPherson. I live at 2001 Pine Knoll, uh, number one. And um, I've lived here uh, two years. I'm going to be speaking about uh, two tree issues in the uh, hillside pool area. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, the first relates to the redwood trees along the edge of the parking lot, and the second relates to the new tree planting in general in the hillside uh, area. This is an important topic for the long-term health and beauty of our park-like setting, uh, and what I'm about to say is not as radical as it might seem. Uh, today, today, board member uh, Ken Anderson will be giving a, pr a presentation about the inappropriate planting of redwood trees in the hillside parking lot, and I'm here to support his position. I'm a landscape architect and uh, former instructor at UC Berkeley Extension in landscape uh, design. When I first moved here, I immediately appreciated the beautiful setting that we live in. After a while, however, I began observing that there appear to be many unfortunate tree planting decisions on GRF land in the past. Errors that will create problems with crowding and blocking of views in the future. As a design professional, I felt I needed to step forward and report what I am seeing and offer suggestions and solutions. And uh, I first, first brought this up to Ken about a year ago. We met up there and, um, and started having conversations about this. The view of the uh, oak woodland of the, of the parking lot is beautiful and will be lost if those redwood trees stay. And Ken will list uh, the other reasons for their removal. The redwoods should be removed while they are still young and do not require a permit. The cost to remove the trees at this stage would be minimal. Before a decision is made about these redwoods, I would like to request a meeting at Hillside to discuss their removal. Um, but that's not the only issue at Hillside. Issue number two is about the placement of new trees throughout that area in the recent past, and this is a topic that Ken will not be talking about. Five to ten years ago, many trees were planted throughout the Hillside area that are far too close together. I would estimate maybe 80% of the new trees that are planted were unnecessary. In some cases, six trees were planted where one would suffice. This is not a good use of planting budget and will create issues of crowding and unhealthy trees in the future. Just because a tree is there doesn't mean it needs to stay. And this is a landscape architect saying this, okay? So um, these issues do not comply with bay-friendly and sustainable standards, which we aim to achieve here at Rossmore. I would like to suggest we review this matter further, perhaps a study of the newer trees in the tree, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, a study about the new tree planting would be in order. At a future date, I would like to talk about a strategy for placing trees in the landscape going forward. Time. Thank you. I'm Sally Kirby. I live at 3425 Terra Granada, number 2B, entry 5. 
And I'm here to invite particularly members of vo voting districts F and G to come to IRV's Meet the Candidates Night. This is going to be held uh, April 10th, which is a Wednesday at Dollar from 5 to 7 or 7.30 p.m. We will be serving light refreshments. We'd also like to invite anyone who votes in Rossmore to come and meet whom, whom these people might be representing. And I would also like to particularly invite the CEO. Uh, thank you all very much. And I hope to see lots of you there. John Ello, is he here? I have a form for him, but maybe he's not. Maybe he changed his mind. Moving on to the next speaker, um, Tank Ang Angus. After this day. Oh, he was here. Okay, Thank go you. ahead. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All the members of the board and people here. Uh, my name is Tancred Aegis. I live at 2740 Tarmigan Drive, number one. And I'm president of the Drama Association of Rossmore and the treasurer of the, uh, the uh, Performing Arts Guild. But I'm here to speak on behalf of all the residents of Rossmore. Two weeks ago, I was helping to direct a show in the last Trampus Room. We had sold out every day, all three days of the show. I noticed that on the first day, at the interval, a few people did not return to the audience. And upon investigation, I found out why. There were no handicapped bathrooms anywhere in the hillside. That's a terrible situation for a, for a population at average age in the high 70s. In the same way, I would address a uh, situation that happened here two years ago about you approved a budget of $7,000 to put a handicap ramp to the dollar house. Well, as of last night, there's no handicap ramp there. I don't know what happened. You have found money to put in three parking spots for the golf course and a, and a huge amount of money to put a, a, a new landscaping in the multi-purpose room area with a road that goes from nowhere and ends up with nowhere. I think if you could find it in your hearts to put in some toilets, for we aging population, your, your efforts would be much rewarded by the whole population. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Allo, go ahead. Mo. Mr. Mo. I'm sorry. His last name is Mo. Yeah, I'm an English teacher, but I guess my writing needs to be improved. <laughs> uh, so my name is John Mo. I live at 1816 Golden Rain Road, number six, entry seven. and. Um, I'm here to talk about recycling. Uh, Tim O'Keefe talked about that. I thought I really appreciated his remarks, thought they were spot on. So what I'd really like to talk about in terms of uh, recycling is um, the Golden Rain Foundation taking a leadership role. I think what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a green Rossmore. So as I've been traveling around Rossmore looking at things like your um, or our um, mission statement, statement of values, and even the, um, all of the plaques that are in the entry to the administration building about the 50th anniversary, um, I've noticed that, um, I, that we need some updating. At least that's what I think. I'd like to encourage the board to, uh, to move in the direction of a green Rossmore, um, which means, of course, sustainability and recycling. I know we do some things already, like the the ping pong building, LEED certified. and So here's some things I'd like the, the board to consider. I, I know that you're doing that to a certain extent already, but I, I'd like to have uh, three stream recycling containers in all of the um, Golden Rain Foundation facilities. And I know that there has been a lack of compliance on that, but we just have to educate the residents, I think, have people there standing there saying, hey, this goes here, that goes there. The second thing I'd like the board to consider is, and maybe you're doing this already, I just don't know, is uh, no single-use plastic. So I think this is a trend that's happening 
worldwide, and I think that Rossmar uh, should, you know, get on the bandwagon and go to no zero use plastic. And the biggest thing that I'm looking for, which I know is tough, is no plastic bags. So <laughs> it seems like wherever you go, that what you see is you see that you have plastic containers, and you have plastic bags, and people take out the plastic bags and throw them away, and that's um, not a good idea. Um, I've been I've been working on this um, quite a bit with the um, organics so recycling up on Pine Knoll, and so every Thursday, which is this afternoon, I go and I look in the trash enclosures, I look in the trash bins, and of course I'm appalled. So much plastic. So those are the three things I'd like you to do is, number one, consider three stream um, recycling receptacles in all of your facilities or our facilities. Consider banning the use of single-use plastics and also see, see if you can get away from plastic bags. So my point is, is that if we want to be successful and lead the way in terms of um, recycling and, and reducing landfill, the way to do it is through education. Hi. And thank you. Ken? Okay, the last just, just, just. I would like to personally thank John Moe for taking the leadership position on this recycling, especially, uh, specifically in First Mutual and generally in Rossmore in, in its entirety. It's often a thankless and a very frustrating job, but a very important one. So thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's okay, it's Carl. Yes, uh, John, has anything been done in terms of cleaning these uh, food recycling bins? Because it, it is an issue. You can't just hose it out because it needs to go into a sewer or something like that. It can't be just, you know, that is an issue. Of, has, has any resolution come? I'm, I'm not aware that that has been a major issue. I think it, by, we can ask to have it cleaned out twice a year. I haven't, I'm not aware that that's been a major issue, but maybe, maybe it's a bigger issue that I'm aware of. Okay. okay, the last two speakers for the Residence Forum are uh, Paul er no, Paula Erickson and Bob Haas. Good morning. My name is Paula Erickson. I live at 2416 Ptarmigan Drive, number one. I'm a landscape architect licensed here in California. I'm the landscape rep for District 15, and I'm on Jerry Yearout's landscape committee for Third Mutual. I want to speak briefly in support of Ken Anderson's presentation and Richard McPherson's statement about the redwood trees planted at the Hillside Pool parking lot. The steep slope behind the Hillside Pool parking lot is a beautiful, natural oak woodland. If the area next to the parking lot were being re-landscaped and planted today, I'm sure that the planting would comply with Rossmore's own landscape requirements of using climate appropriate, low water use plants, and it would be designed to preserve the view of the adjoining native open space. Rebecca might choose a mix of native shrubs and trees for that area that would blend with and complement the slope in the background. Now, I understand that after having to sink, I guess, a million dollars, <laughs> is that right now, um, into creek restoration, the expense and trumple of removing those redwoods is just not a high priority. However, if you leave them, then Rossmore has kicked the can down the road to future residents. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with having to budget to remove very large trees that were the wrong tree in the wrong place, planted long ago, that grew up to be eyesores or problems, and then we all stand around and say to ourselves, what were they thinking? And I'm afraid that 50 years from now, when those trees are monsters, the residents are gonna stand in that parking lot and do the same thing and say, what were they thinking? They knew this was gonna be a problem and they could have fixed it and they didn't. So Rossmore has a written landscape design intent in the general plan, and Rossmore has a very experienced landscape manager and staff to execute it. So here's a chance to backtrack just a bit, make a correction. 
one small step that will help to preserve and to celebrate the native environment that surrounds us here in Rossmore. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Haas. I live at 1101 Leisure Lane number four, Mutual Two. My comments address the redwoods along the perimeter of the hillside parking lot. My expertise with native plants and plant communities um, due to my 20 years of involvement with the California Native Plant Society, first as an active volunteer with the Sonoma County chapter and then and as an avid home gardener and later as a paid editor for the California Native Plant Society. For six and a half years, I served as editor of their statewide quarterly botanical journal and for 12 years was editor of their statewide newsletter. Regarding the redwoods at Hillside, it's my understanding that the redwoods were planted next to the Hillside parking lot to provide shade for cars. However, this was a mistake because redwoods are never used primarily as a shade tree. Why? Because they primarily grow upright, unlike shade trees, which have a spreading growth structure. Number two, redwoods are never found in oak woodland plant communities, such as the areas surrounding hillside, and have very different water needs. Oaks like hot, dry summers with no water, while redwoods prefer cool, moist summers and coastal fog drip. We should never be planting redwoods in Rossmore. In fact, the Master Gardeners of Contra Costa County recommends against planting redwoods anywhere in central or east Contra Costa County. Rossmore plantings and natural areas should, whenever possible, mimic the surrounding native habitat. We in Rossmore have a responsibility to be good stewards of the land, to protect it. In practical terms, that means we should only add plants to our natural areas, such as our oak woodland habitat, that are found there naturally. Number three, redwoods block views due to their height. The hillside redwoods will eventually block all views to the surrounding oak woodland, which will violate general plan policy OSL 2.1, which states that views of open space areas in Rossmore should be protected. Number four, the redwoods near the hillside parking lot are still small enough that they can be removed now, but since they gain one inch or more in diameter per year, according to UC, Berkeley, UC Davis, all of them should be removed soon. Thanks very much. Thanks. So before we get to our committee reports, I want to mention that this screen that is sort of frustrating for residents is going to go away soon. We're now experimenting with, uh, there's a monitor here that will replace that. Uh, we're testing it right now. So once we come up with an alternative solution, uh, then that screen will be going away, but it may take a couple of meetings. So now to the committee reports, the Aquatics Committee, Brian. Morning. Um, is this on? Yes. I guess it is. Um, our report is uh, complete and accurate as presented. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I have one short statement I'd like to make. Any questions? For I have a question. Um, how did you determine how you were going to split the time and hours when closing down the pools because of the uh, uh, shortage of lifeguards? Uh, that wasn't a committee decision. No. Okay. Yeah, it was done by staff. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, nope. Okay, thank you. A short statement. Um, just a, a response, quick response to the uh, letter in the Rossmore News yesterday. Um, our decision to encourage uh, lane sharing at the, the lap swimming facilities uh, was spurred by um, input from residents who were upset with the crowding conditions uh, during some of the busier hours of lap swim, and they encouraged us to find ways to promote lane sharing. Uh, we did that. So, that's, so that's, my understanding is that it's not mandatory, but the no, it's people, certainly not so, mandatory. It would never right. be mandatory. Um, we realize that people have concerns about sharing lanes. Um, some people can do it, some people can't, and no one should ever feel uh, guilty or shamed because they can't or won't share a lane for their various reasons. Their reasons are as valid as anybody's reasons. I think. Okay. Thank you. Right. Finance committee bill.
Thank you. Good morning. The regular meeting of the GRF Finance Committee was held last Tuesday. <clears throat> After discussion of the recommendation made last month, the committee recommends that the prospective increase in membership transfer fee from $9,000 to $10,000 be made effective for any transfers that close escrow on or after July 1st, 2019. So in addition to the recommendation itself, we're also suggesting that uh, it happen uh, as soon as that, if possible. Uh, secondly, the committee also reviewed the current reports to update trust estate revenue projections to reflect current conditions and to consider additional adding additional detail. Our monthly monitoring will continue through the next several months and will culminate in a revised recommendation in late June as to the trust estate funding level available for the remainder of 2019. Any questions? No questions. I think we need a motion, though. Um, Mary? I move that we increase the membership transfer fee from 9000 to 10000 effective for any transfers that close escrow on or after July 1st, 2019. I second that. Discussion? Well, I have some questions. Uh, well, first I want to make a comment just to let people know that since the last time we re raised the fee uh, to $9,000, just the, the uh, devaluation of the dollar due to inflation uh, has been about $1,000. So this would just keep us up even with inflation. But my question is why we can't do this in two months uh, instead of three months. Is there, it seems to me two months would be plenty of notice uh, to the realtor on the board. Is there a logistical reason? It, it has to do with it has to do with us telling the public here in Rossmore. They need the newspaper to tell them generally about three months. Okay. Ken? I like to think of this transfer fee as an, an, buying into the investment of Rossmore. We have all been paying a lot of money to live here in a beautiful environment and everything. And I took the, a couple of months ago, I took the value of a Rossmore, GRF prop, uh, Rossmore, and divided by uh, 6,776 manors, and the uh, sum came out to well over $11,000, I believe. That's a very rough and, in, and not entirely accurate method of doing it, but that's, that's the way I think of it. So that this $10,000 uh, would be under uh, the value that we already have invested, and they would uh, receive the benefits by joining Rossmore. When was the last year? 2015. September 2015 from seven to 9,000. Steve? Yes, just a comment. Um, it was discussed that at the time a significant uh, expense then moved from the coupon to the uh, trust and therefore paid by the membership transfer fee and the other principal invest or principal income for the trust, that we make this move to ten thousand dollars. So it's it's not a um, a new thing to to be discussed. However, we've also improved fairly significantly on our ability to forecast the uses and the. Uh, therefore the reserve that is left over. And we currently have such a projection that looks out to 2030 or thereabouts. My last view of that would say that there, we could, if we were able to do a little belt tightening as to the capital spending we have, that we're going to have plenty of money with current levels of income once we get out past 27, 28, and so on. Um, I would have preferred the decision be made, and I think that's the approach that was used back when it was first discussed. I would prefer the decision be made essentially based upon our expected use. Um, heaven knows 
there could be a couple bumps in the road in the next three years or four years. But once you get by that, I don't know that we need to go from nine to $10,000 on this membership fee. It's, uh, I think it's been amply discussed and I respect the recommendation of the Finance Committee, but I think we ought to at least put on the table that as mm -hmm. our future becomes present and we're able to look more closely at the potential for significant resources in the trust, that maybe uh, we, we look at it again from a negative perspective and go back. Other questions, Carl? Yes. One of the things I think we're looking at is we're looking at a number of projects that are, that are going to involve capital expenditures that will, in effect, increase, increase the efficiency of our operations here and therefore end up lowering the coupon. And I think that uh, these are not going to be big expenses. I think we need the capital to put these investments in place so that we can help maintain the coupon for our existing residents. Ken? Ken? Well, Rossmore is a bargain. It really is. As Tim well pointed out, uh, we have some of the best values in the whole area. When I moved here nine years ago, I looked at properties in, in Lafayette and Walnut Creek and found out that it, anything equivalent or even thing close to being equivalent was twice as much uh, money to move to, into uh, with 1% of the amenities that we here offer. So people are getting a bargain at 10,000 or 20,000. They would be getting a bargain uh, with Rossmore. Please ignore the $20,000 comment. <laughs> Jerry? Uh, no. I, uh, Jerry. I might be wrong about this, and, but, and I'm open to correction, but many of the expenditures recommended uh, on that list of projects came from long study by the Technology Committee. Is that not so? It was a mixture. There were a few on there that the staff had already started and were supported by the Technology Committee, but many weren't. Uh, technology items also. So, Mary? Yeah, I, I want to point out that in 2015 when the coupon was raised, the Finance Committee Charter was changed. Not the coupon. Excuse me. <laughs> the membership transfer fee was increased. The Finance Committee Charter was changed and it states that the Finance Committee will do an annual review of the membership transfer fee. So that's point number one. It's a responsibility of the Finance Committee to do that and they're doing what they have been chartered to do. Secondly, I think we should look at the increase in value in the property at Rossmore. The reason it increases largely is due to the capital investments that we make. And we all benefit uh, because our places are worth a lot more money than they were 10 years ago. So I can support this increase. Um, and when I look at the capital needs over the next three years, we have some pretty expensive projects that we may take on. So uh, if we want to do them, then, then we've got to get the money somewhere. So that's my two cents. Any other comments? Les. Just want to make sure that everyone understands that this fee is a membership fee for members to use all the amenities that are developed. And the amenities are developed from the membership transfer fee. It has nothing to do with the coupon. It doesn't change the coupon, but it does allow us to make uh, changes. You talk about handicap bathrooms, for example. Those are capital expenses. That's where it would come from in this uh, raised to $10,000, and the projects that are on the list, <coughs> excuse me, projects that are on the list will all, will all be paid from the trust account. So without the increase in the additional money, it will just take longer to do the projects, and who knows what projects are going to come up in the meantime. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. 
uh, all in favor of increasing the membership transfer fee from $9,000 to $10,000 effective for transactions on or after July 1st, 2019, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Now to the fitness center report, Catherine. Uh, in February, there were 21,963 visits to the fitness center. Four more, four more Pilates reformer classes will be added to the schedule in April, as well as three yoga classes taught by our new fitness lead, Noah Yuzna. These are small group training sessions, and so they will be fee-based. We have some new fitness equipment in the gym a back extension in the room near the lockers, and two spin bikes in the dance studio. As we have a trainer currently on leave, two part-time trainers are working extra hours on the floor to provide residents with assistance and answer questions. The access control system is being updated with the addition of a pedestal and monitor in front of the turnstiles. This will make it easier to tell if your key fob has registered before going through the gates. So far, this system has allowed us to better track renters and guests at the gym. Staff is still working to improve the system so it will read at greater distances and work better with the matrix equipment. Thanks to the GRF policy committee, we, have, we finally have a resolution to the problem of guest fees for clubs who use the gym, such as the tap dancers. Rather than charging their members $10 per visit, clubs will be billed $10 per month per non-resident member. The front desk will collect billing information on club guests who will not use the facility other than for their classes and practice. This system will begin in April. Any questions? Carl. It's brought to uh, my attention that how do we have the procedures in place now for the clubs to, play, to pay for this, this $10 a month fee? Uh, yes. So they should contact the front desk uh, on how to do this? Right, right. Okay, right. thank you. And that, they'll start in April, they'll start registering the members, so it'll be by month, and if somebody shows up in, you know, in April and doesn't come in May, they won't be charged that ten dollars. Any other questions for Catherine? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Steve. I'm sorry. I I wanted to comment that I admire your new dashboard. Uh, I think this may be the first time this particular form has been used. Tell me what I should expect or know about the unique uh, user as opposed to the open numbers? Well, it's just a distinction, you know. So if one person shows up once a month, they count as one person, but if the same person shows up 10 times in the month, they'll be counted differently. So. So this it's represents a, a new way of using the information that yes. is captured? Yes. And Very that's interesting. Been, Thank and, you. And it's been requested for years. I've lived here for 10 years, and I can remember the board bringing this up way back. I might even have been one of those asking for it, but I didn't realize that it was there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now the uh, golf report. Mark? I am filling in for uh, Chairman uh, John McDonald, who's out of town right now. First thing I want to say is uh, thank you to our CEO, Tim O'Rourke, for very um, O'Keefe, for a very nice uh, plug there for the golf shop. I really appreciate that, Tim. Uh, we do need that right now. And we do have a special right now, clearance men's shirts, $19.95 down there currently. So I do expect you all to come down and some women's wear next week. It has been a very difficult winter in going into spring. And um, Treasurer Neff made a very good report there. I think the income versus expenses report would have been even farther apart had we not made some important decisions, which you may see inside the reports. We currently have three positions open on the golf course. We are trying to fill one right now. 
We started the year with one opening. We lost employees. We had two. And then this last month, we lost another one. So with three openings, we are saving some money there. We're not filling them right away just because of the uh, income being down. Uh, we do have hopefully one new hire coming on this next month. But that was a, a decision to not fill those gaps while we were uh, in the in a kind of a crisis situation with income. Um, on the golf shop side, um, we have cut several hours and saved over $10,000 there. Um, so not only are people not playing golf, but those in the golf shop have had to take a hit too, um, just because we, we had to to save money. So it's, it's been tough, but we are going to come out of it. Uh, we have a big tournament going on today down there, and uh, I know just right around the corner it is going to get better. Uh, if you have any questions about the uh, uh, financials or some of the GAC uh, report, I'm here to answer them. Any questions? I have a suggestion. Why don't you offer, uh, following up on Tim's uh, ideas of yes. people taking lessons, why don't you offer a free orientation or something where people can come down, swing some golf clubs, see what it's like, people who've never played before, just to get a sense of what golf is about. I mean, I've never played golf myself, and I'd probably take advantage of something like that. Um, you know, we've been doing some of that just right inside the golf shop. So if you want to come down, uh, even when it's raining, we gave a putting lesson in the golf shop yesterday. So uh, it, it can be done. <laughs> I'll take Thank you up you. on it. Okay, thanks. Tim. Uh, Bob's probably too shy to ask, but um, Mark, have you ever considered uh, having uh, Hawaiian shirts in your shop? <laughs> no answer required. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to the Compensation Committee. Mary. Thanks, Bob. So my report today is first going to um, summarize the Compensation Committee's March 18th meeting, uh, because I think uh, we, we accomplished a great deal, and I want to share it not just with the board, but the residents. I'm going to talk about some reports that staff produced for the committee. They are all in the compensation agenda package for March 18th. And there's a summary of the reports in today's board package. So I've explained before that when we, the compensation committee, attempt to design a salary program right now for 2020, it's really a forecast because we have to have our uh, our proposal to the board about July, and this is all driven by the coupon. But we really don't know what the market's going to do January 2020. We have a compensation management structure developed in 2011. We have a compensation management philosophy that talks about paying our employees competitive market rates. So. I always say we're looking to develop the Goldilocks compensation structure. Not too much, not too little, just right. So since we're forecasting, the committee, uh, and I want to introduce the members because they're very experienced. We have Les Birdsall, who I know chaired the committee at least once. Steve chaired it. And then Carl Brown, who's been on it for two years, Carl. And he has gathered all sorts of salary data and sliced it and diced it. So the committee members asked for some reports, nine of them, from the staff. We're calling them look back reports and they are designed to help us evaluate how the 2019 program is working. So uh, on at the meeting, we got through five of the nine reports. The last four will be done at the April meeting. So I'll um, describe just a couple of the reports. One of the requirements introduced by Tim in 2017 as part of the employee performance management system was to um, rate employees' performance on a scale to zero to five. And this is for non-union employees, by the way. So one of the questions we had was, well, how's that working? And as you can imagine, the first time the managers were asked to differenti 
differentiate performance um, with their staff. That's a very hard thing to implement. I've uh, done that once or twice in my life. So for 2007, in, for the 2018 program, things were a little skewed. But for 2018, we looked at the data, and there's much more granularity, not so skewed. So I think the managers are understanding how to differentiate performance, and so that is moving in the right direction, and we were happy to see it. We also asked for an over and under report. So it turns out, um, because we're forecasting salaries, that every year we seem to end up with some employees who are not they're paid below their salary band, which is not a good thing, and we don't want to do that. And then we also have a few who are paid above their band. So what we did with these reports is to compare 2018 to 2019, and we see that we have fewer people under the band and fewer over. Uh, so again, that's a second report, tells us things are moving in the right direction. Then we asked the CFO, he prepared a budge, budget wage comparison over three years, the last three years. We looked at what was budgeted for salary versus what was actually spent. And in all three cases, less is being spent than is budgeted. And part of the reason for that is our open positions stay open longer, uh, which is a bit of a red flag to us. And it leads to one of the recommendations we're going to make today. Then the other thing that we asked for was, how does this market adjustment pool that we have funded for the last two years get used? Uh, for 2019, the pool was $130,000. We called it a market adjustment pool. One of the reasons we do this is because we know we're forecasting salary, and we don't know how far off we're going to be. And so it was to address people who are under their band, and uh, some of the money was used for that. It also is uh, a pool that can be used for uh, merit awards. And uh, merit awards were given to some employees. So there's a very disciplined process in how that happens. The employees must be nominated by their managers. Um, so we felt, we felt that the pool was being used correctly, and we also noted that in both years that we've done this, uh, the complete money in the pool is not spent. So those four reports were helpful, and we have asked to include them in what we're calling the 2020 seed suite of reports. There was a fifth report that we wanted. It's uh, called the Bell Curve Report. A report like that was produced in 2011 by outside consultants using market salary data, looking at market medians. Uh, and then at that time, the committee said, once every five years, <clears throat> we need to hire the outside consultant. So we did it in 2016, and that showed that we were absolutely moving in the right direction for our salary treatment. Um, but what we discovered is we, the staff really cannot produce that report. It requires a great deal of outside market data and some tools. So we are going to continue with the process of getting the report once every five years. And in the interim, we have a process for looking at market medians, uh, sample data, and we do that in November. So four of the five reports we'll continue to look at, and the uh, other four we'll evaluate in April. And now that leads me to uh, the next topic in the compensation committee agenda. And uh, this is a bit complicated. First of all, I guess I want to ask the committee members, do you have any comments on the reports before we move on to the next topic? I think you did a great job. <laughs> OK, thanks. I understood what you said. I'm sure the residents will, too. Well, I, don't, I hope they will. It's, it's a very complicated topic. Um, so now I want to talk about our proposal. The committee discussed this in February. I mentioned it last month. And to, to talk about it, I have to explain the uh, salary bands for individual positions. The structure that was developed in 2011 allows for a 30% band. We hire at 
0.9% of market median for a given position, and the cap is 1.2% of market median, or the 75th percentile, whichever is lower. So it's... 1.2 times 1.2%. Excuse me, yes. Right, 1.2 times the median, 120%. The, the part of the criteria that reduces the cap, that's the 75th percentile if it's lower, the committee feels hampers uh, recruiting. Uh, potentially, it hampers retention because if we are paying people under what they can get outside, then they can leave. So we are uh, recommending, and I'll make a motion now, and if we get a second, we can talk about it. We're recommending to the board that they approve removing the seven, I'm, I'm moving that uh, we remove the 75th percentile limitation in the compensation management system when determining the compensation cap. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Carl? Yes, I did a study of how the 75th percentile affects our salaries. And looking at our specific job categories and classifications, uh, on the average, it, it, we are looking at 10% at below or 20% above. That's because we feel that we are not dealing with, we want a better than average employee. We are not taking training. We get more productivity out of a superior person. Therefore, we figure as part of this compensation that we should be paying, on average, about 5% above the market median. And in essence, it should save us money, both in terms of turnover and productivity. So even though we might be paying more than the market median, um, we will be getting more for our dollar than we would otherwise. Now, when we look at the 75th percentile, we can adjust that median, but we have done nothing to adjust that 75th percentile. As a consequence, on average, it cuts that cap down dramatically, in some cases well below that 5% median, and therefore, we feel that we are not giving our managers the right to hire people at levels that the market is currently asking, especially in this, uh, this uh, tight job market. And we feel that we need to allow our, mar our managers to have the discretion to hire the people they need to fill these jobs. It will save us over time. It will save us hiring expensive temporary people. And uh, unless we actually implemented some extremely complex mathematical formulations to adjust that 75th percentile, it is doing more damage than it is doing good. Any other comments about this, Steve? Yeah. I Again, it'd be a great idea, and we've, we uh, certainly spent time in the committee talking about what would be the impact of making that uh, decision so that you had comfort that we were not exceeding the allowance we've provided for compensation in 2019. Uh, it turns out that there were a very modest number of persons involved. Uh, three to six right. in total that we've uh, talked about. And I, we, we don't see these individuals' names or even know what their positions are, but we just see they, this is an individual, an employee within uh, Rossmore that has a position that is this X versus the uh, median. And we feel that the potential for impact in making this move is very small. Other comments? 
Jerry. I want to congratulate the committee as I did um, after they took this step. It's very hard when you've done a, a process the same way as we have since 2011 to say maybe we need to make a change and, and to marshal the energy within the committee to make that change. So I think they did a great job and they're to be congratulated. I was gonna follow that with a vote that would have affirm the decision, but go ahead, Mary. I, I, I just uh, realized I didn't, in my motion, I didn't say when this is effective. And so I think I should amend the motion and say it'll be effective with the January 2020 compensation package. Okay, I think technically then I guess we're supposed to vote on amending that, or on the amendment. Right, so, um, I don't know if that's true, but anyway, for whoever seconded, that was Ken, Steve. was it? Steve, are you okay with that amendment? amendment? Well, I guess uh, I had a Rossmore moment at the time. I, it seemed to me our conversations were about putting it into a place immediately. Point of order. Is that, is that a yes? Point of order. Okay. Mike, your mic. Robert, rules of order says that once a motion has been seconded and read, it is the jurisdiction of the whole board and does not require or, or need a second's approval. Okay, well, we're just covering our bases here, so. And he didn't actually say yes anyway, he approved it. So Carl, further discussion? Yes, I believe that with our hiring problem, lifeguards, for example, that we have a number of positions that are empty I would like to make an amendment that this 75th percentile is removed immediately, which would allow us to fill some of these positions better. So, uh, Bob, can I? Just a second. Is there a second to his proposal? I'm going to second it, which means I'm amending my original motion. <laughs> Because I think I can do that. You... No, I'm just trying to simplify it. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just think when we make this motion, we need an effective date. So I will change it to effective immediately, if that is what the committee wants to do. I, I don't think it's going to make uh, much of a financial difference one way or the other. Okay, so we have a motion that has been amended according to our Roberts Rules of Order Specialist. We don't need the person who seconded the original motion to approve this, so I'm just gonna move along to any further discussion, hopefully not, and then we'll vote on the thing. Can, can we read what we're gonna vote on? <laughs> <laughs> I, Somebody, okay, Mary will repeat. I'm going to restate. repeat it and do it right this time. I move that we remove the 75th percentile limitation in the compensation management system when determining the compensation cap effective immediately. Yeah. Nope. Okay. No second needed. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I think that was unanimous. Thank you. Oh, Tim. Just if I could just add one comment just to make sure everybody mm -hmm. is clear. By removing the 75th percentile, that does not remove the upper cap. The upper cap is still in place at 1.2 or 120% of the market median for a given wage. So there's still a cap, it's just moving this other constraint that was placed in 2011 uh, that would be lower than 120% of the market median or 1.2 times the median. So that upper cap is still in place, even with this action that you've taken. Thank you. Now we're gonna move on to unfinished business and uh, some policy committee business. Jerry. Okay, so this morning is the second reading of policy 204, whistleblower policy. This is a procedure for residents, vendors, and uh, other than employees to uh, approach when they th think they have a grievance about uh, adherence to policy or procedure. For example, 
We have a stipulated bidding process. If a resident feels we haven't adhered to that process, this is the route you would take to make your, uh, your grievance known. Uh, I move that we approve policy, whistleblower policy 204 um, as approved by the policy committee and the audit committee. Do I hear a second? I second. Okay, any discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, unanimous, thank you. Now we're going to go on to new business. Unfortunately, uh, as Tim mentioned last month, my summary of the motion about the capital projects was uh, inaccurate to say the least. And so to clear up the uh, confusion, we're going to uh, first rescind that motion uh, and then we will address the capital projects with a more detailed and complete motion. So could I hear a motion to rescind the motion that we made last month that effectively deferred projects but did not approve any projects? I so, I so In, move. Let's see. Second? Anyone? Second. Okay, Mary has seconded. Any discussion of this? Questions? I apologize for the confusion. Okay, all in favor of rescinding, whoops, did someone, what? Okay, uh, we're rescinding the motion that uh, effectively just deferred some projects that did not approve uh, any capital projects. Uh, so all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we'll move to the uh, actual motion that we should have made last month that is much more detailed. I'll do that if you want. Okay, Mary, would you like to make yes. a motion? I move that we approve the expenditure of $1,529,000 from the trust estate fund for the following projects. The fiber optic cable, $220,000. Database integration, $55,000. Golf course irrigation pump replacement, $18,000. Dollar pool plaster replacement, $85,000. Electrical upgrade mod corp yard, $16,000. Gateway HVAC replacement, $615,000. Valleywide street maintenance, $520,000. Shall I list the deferred ones as well? Yeah. And defer consideration of the following 10 projects until at least July 2019. Rossmore web portal, 35000 Oak Room Flooring Replacement, $45,000. Gateway Generator, $225,000. Renovate Dollar Restrooms on the first floor, $80,000. Gateway Large Conference Room Upgrade, $20,000. Renovate Vista and Las Trompas Rooms Hillside, $100,000. Replace Office Partitions in the Rec Department, $30,000. The Trash Recycling Containers for Event Center, $25,000. The Ball Wall Buckeye Tennis Complex, $6,000. The Design Plans for the Green Fairway and the $14 Golf Course. The note, do I want to do that one as well? You okay. You make that a statement after the motion. Okay, so that, I finished the motion. Okay, the second? Sue has seconded that. Discussion, Steve. If you'll recall, uh, I voted no last time, and many of the problems that I had had to do, first of all, with the evaluation or prioritization pride or plan or uh, how we arrived at these. And secondly, I'd like to to make sure that at the time that this is reconsidered, that there is the possibility that we not accept them in total, but go one at a time through each of them for the consideration of approval. Uh, 
I think it would be inappropriate to take the position we have of deciding that they were unworthy to have money set aside now, and yet they are all of, that their worthiness is acceptable for the future. So uh, I can't and won't make an attempt to, to change the uh, uh, current motion, but I would like to make sure that the expectations of the board are such that you could do something a little different than approve them in total. And I might add that there may very well be other projects that emerge between now and then as well. So, Carl? Yes, I think one of these things is these priorities have been set up by an incomplete process and planning. And we have outlined, and I think Mary was very good at bringing this information in, is that it was really a five-step process of which this is just the first step. I voted for the project because most of these have an immediacy that I think needs to be addressed. But I think in the future, and what I expect to happen with the planning committee, is that we continue to develop the full planning process during this year and apply it to both these projects as well as the tech projects. And I think this will give us a better perspective, but I think because of the immediacy of some of these projects, we've probably got to move forward on them now, but in the future, projects should take a, a, a deeper scrutiny than we've applied to these. Well, I urge the planning committee to review this process since this was the first time we've really used it and, and do some, make some suggestions and uh, just sort of really evaluate it for, for future years. But um, Les, I just gave you a job. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you're doing that a lot lately. Um, just, just to comment on Carl and, and Steve's, uh, as chair of the planning committee, uh, we have accomplished the first step. We have evaluated the board's priorities for this year. Uh, and we have not, on some of these, gone through the whole five-step process in terms of what do we really want to do, what's the most important, what does the staff think about what should be done. All of that is coming up, I hope. Uh, and of course, uh, it's very likely that there will be a new planning committee come May when they have the board elections and new board members and so on. So uh, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work to be done. And so uh, I, the members of the planning committee that have worked on this, I appreciate all your help. And you and I both know that there's a lot that has to be done before it's complete. Any other comments before we vote? Okay, all in favor of the motion. I'm not going to restate it since Mary did such a complete job. Um, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Now uh, we're going to consider, uh, a, go ahead. I think it would be good for you to read that yes, third right. note just to clarify for it. Just, that's kind of the missing piece right. that just okay. ties the rest of this together. I put it underneath before I should have. You're right. So as Tim mentioned originally in his CEO report, we had some placeholders in our budget discussions of some very large projects because we felt it was not appropriate to evaluate the capital budget without considering these projects, uh, one which is an emergency, uh, and two that were already, or two of the others that we're already uh, in the middle of sort of working on. So as placeholders, we have not approved the following projects, but we are keeping a uh, possibility of, of approving those in the future. So we've left sort of room in our capital budget. And those three projects are the uh, Creek Restoration Project, the Water Reclamation Plant, and the Gateway Studio Construction uh, project. So moving on now to the um, consider approving the appointment of the audit firm Burr Pilger Mayer 
to count the ballots for the upcoming election of GRF directors to represent District F, District G, and authorizing the CEO to execute a letter of understanding outlining the scope of the services to be provided. Do you want a motion? Yes. I move that we appoint the audit firm Burr Pilger Mayor to count the ballots for the upcoming election of GRF directors to represent District F and District G and authorizing the CEO to execute a letter of understanding outlining the scope of the services to be provided. Second. Sue seconded. Any discussion of this? Okay, let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Approved unanimously. Now we're going to hear a presentation from uh, Rebecca on landscape. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay if I stand sort of here? Yeah? Okay. Um, thank you, Javier. That gave me a chance to catch my breath. Uh, good morning, everybody. If it could still be called morning, we're almost at 11 o'clock here. Um, this presentation is to just sort of take you on a virtual tour through the various areas that GRF manages. Um, uh, last year, in another presentation that I gave, I promised that I would let you know sort of what was coming up in terms of what work needed to be done with the GRF landscapes, what you need to keep your heads up for, what we have covered, and what we'll need help from you with. So nothing is dire, uh, nothing to worry about here. I hope you can enjoy the presentation. The last page will have a list of all of the things that I need you to consider for the future. So if you forget anything at all, you can always refer back to that last page. So, okay. These are all the properties that we manage in-house. So there are seven clubhouses. Does that sound right? Seven clubhouses, four parks, and then three sort of entities of what we consider trust property, and I'll walk you through each one of these. So as Paul had explained a couple of weeks ago, we have a large department up at MOD, and some of it is used to manage mutual operations, and some of it is used to manage GRF operations. Um, for the landscape, GRF has an in-house crew that works only for GRF and exclusively for GRF. And in that crew, we have five landscape technicians, one irrigation technician, and one supervisor. We contract out all of the lawn and turf care um, and we also contract out large construction projects. But in-house, we do all of the grounds maintenance, so pruning, weeding, blowing, um, and you know general cleanup, stuff like that. We also maintain the trails. We do a lot of small projects in and around the clubhouses and trust properties. We do all the mulching, again, on trust properties, all of the irrigation. We maintain the sport courts to a degree, uh, mostly just cleaning. And we do the color spot installations and maintenance. And I will get to that, but we don't manage all of the color spots. We manage only some of them. So we'll do the clubhouses first. Obviously, Gateway Clubhouse Complex is where we are now. Um, I consider this to be sort of the hub of Rossmore, or at least one of two hubs of Rossmore. And in general, it's in pretty good shape. I, I, this, this clubhouse, to me, seems to be pretty young. I don't know how old it is exactly. Um, but you know, nothing dire here, but there are some things that we need to keep, on, keep in mind for the future. Um, 
And what I would like to suggest for this clubhouse and all clubhouses, whenever you're doing a project, even if you think that it's not landscape related, you should set aside some funds for landscaping because it always comes up. Um, so for the ceramic studio, I don't know if you've done the budgeting yet for that. I'm not necessarily going to ask that you set aside some landscaping, but just keep in mind that there will be landscaping associated with that. So we've started our, our uh, lavender garden in the back. So we did have two really large pine trees here that were removed because they were both infected with pine bark beetle. One was removed a couple of years ago and one was removed recently. We had some funds set aside to do the California native garden, but then learned about the ceramic studio, so postponed that. So we used our resources to do this instead. Um, it's in progress now. Some of the plants are in the ground. The rain has really uh, messed us up because every time we start doing something, it starts raining raining again, um, but pretty soon we'll have a nice garden back here, and we were able to do it pretty economically because we did it all in-house. This is the entry to the board office, and wow, that just looks bad, I think. So this is something we'll be touching up just a little bit. We'll do it in-house. It'll cost very little money, but you know, if you ever walk by that when you park your cars, just know that you won't have to look at that for much longer. This is the area that's directly outside of the fireside room. It was, it looks like it may have been fairly recently landscaped, um, but I think that there's a big opportunity here to not only create a view from the inside, but to perhaps create a seating area or a place for people um, on staff here to go and have lunch or even just sort of have an open flow between this area and fireside. So this is a pretty low priority. I won't ask for any money to do this, but it may be a couple of years off and we'll do it when we have the resources available to do that. And then finally, this is where we will eventually have a California native garden. I've talked about it before. This is directly outside the ceramic studio. So we will visit this uh, when the ceramic studio is done. And we're going to have a test garden there, see what kinds of natives we can use on site, which other ones may not work so well on site, and a place for everybody to come and familiarize themselves with the different natives that we do believe will thrive here. Um, and then this is just a little tiny spot right in the back corner of parking. Um, I don't know how to explain it. If you walk out towards the MPR, the multi-purpose rooms, this is just outside of there. I would like to eventually, again, in-house make this a very small succulent garden. People ask for succulents a lot, and they're really fun. Um, they don't always do very well here, so this is a perfect spot for a very tiny little test garden. Um, the Tice Valley Fitness Center in Dog Park, the cutest spot in all of Rossmore, I like to think. Um, but the Tice Valley Fitness Center is a great example of how, uh, and I've spoken to Jeff about this, um, and he agrees, I think. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, it was a big project. I, I don't recall how much money you spent, but there was very little left over for landscaping. And when all was said and done, landscaping had to come in there and sort of hold the bag and say, OK, well, we'll do what we can with the very little funds that we have. And we were able to do that. We pulled it together. Um, but in the future, whenever you're doing sort of a big renovation like that, make sure that you are also thinking about updating the landscape, even if the landscape is not in very bad shape. There's not much point in having a brand new beautiful building with landscaping that looks outdated. Um, when you work in sort of residential, they say that 10% of the value of your home should be spent towards landscaping. So you can use that as a rough figure. That is a large number and no one does 10%, but it's still something to strive for. Creekside Clubhouse in Pickleball, again, this landscape is actually in really good shape. Um, the creek renovation, not renovation, the creek repairs that are happening there make me a little nervous. There could definitely be some landscape impacts that that will have. So when you do start doing the budgeting for the creek, um, just keep that in mind. The event center. I think that the landscaping was so well designed and executed there. I think it's beautiful. I think it, you know, it's really, really colorful. Um, and I wouldn't say that it was a mistake that was made, but a lot of the plants that were used were short-lived. So we're getting to the point right about now, I'd say in 2020 or 2021, we're going to have to replace a lot of the plants there. There's a lot of lavender. There's a lot of sage. 
Um, and while those are useful and beautiful and drought tolerant plants, as I said, they do sort of start to peter out after a certain period of time. So we should be able to do a lot of this in house, um, but there may come a time where you'll see a lot of these plants being removed and it's not because we're saying the event center is ugly, we're redoing it, it's just because we need to replace some of those plants. Dollar Clubhouse. Um, Again, I think that origin, you know, the original design intent of Dollar Clubhouse was gorgeous, and all in all, there's not that much landscaping work that needs to be done there. However, this keeps happening. This is the third tree to fall over in the last three years, and we had to remove a fourth because it was leaning so heavily over the parking lot. Um, these are very old trees. They say that oak trees will grow for 100 years, live for 100 years, and die for 100 years. So assuming these oak trees are about 300 years old, they are reaching the end of their lifespan, um, and that's compounded by when we get really heavy rains and the soil gets saturated, we actually have a failure of the soil, not of the tree. But these are big, heavy trees, and if they're imbalanced in any way, they'll pull their own roots right up out of the ground. So. We'll be walking around the clubhouse and looking at what to do about the variety of oaks that we've lost, um, and we'll be replanting and interplanting quite a few of them. So while Dollar Clubhouse is not necessarily on the agenda now, if we have some sort of reserve savings account for it, there may come a time where we're going to have to do some fairly serious work there. Buckeye Grove, Luther Burbank, and Tennis Courts. This is a very naturalistic landscape. It needs very little attention. Um, most people are just walking right by there on their way to the tennis courts. But some fun facts, there are some big, very old Buckeyes there. And my predecessor, Rich Perona, collected a lot of the seed pods, and he germinated them and then replanted them. So if you go to Buckeye Grove, you'll see that there's a lot of trees with fences around them and these weird kind of pipes sticking out of the ground um, because they're not irrigated. But those were mostly all planted by Rich Perona. And then we come to Hillside Clubhouse. So a couple of people had mentioned Hillside Clubhouse about the, you know, the restrooms and the trees on the hillside, et cetera. Of all of the clubhouses, Hillside, in terms of the landscape, is the oldest and the most in need of attention. I wouldn't call this an urgent emergency, but as soon as is possible, I think that we should be budgeting to rethink the landscape here. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot that needs to be done. And I'll walk you all through it right now. Um, and I would like to sort of get together. I, Jeff, I don't know if you know if there's any plans in the near future to do any building repairs there. Are there? Yeah, OK. So assuming that one day Hillside will be renovated to some degree, maybe we could coordinate the landscape with that. But there is a lot of work to be done there, and also a lot of opportunity for modernization and water conservation. So the first thing is this area as you come in on the right-hand side. So as you can see, there were a lot of pine trees there. And they all died of beetle and were removed. And this is what we have left to look at. Um, there are certainly a lot of trees in this area. We don't need to do much planting. But I would like to get rid of those stumps and perhaps rebuild the wall and maybe just touch this area up somehow. This is a fairly small project and something that we can certainly do in-house. But if we're going to consider doing the Hillside Clubhouse as a whole, I'd like to have it done as a comprehensive project so that it looks unified. This is the Rotary Pavilion, uh, there, which is sort of behind table tennis. And this little lawn there is nice. It's very pretty. But the shape of it makes it impossible to water. I should have taken a photo of it with the sprinklers on. Um, but to, you know, just the sh I don't even know how to describe that shape. A circle with a cutout. So when you turn the sprinklers on, the benches get wet, the entire sidewalk gets watered, and it's just runoff everywhere. It's such a small piece of lawn that, yes, even though it's beautiful, it's just so inefficient that we should really be looking at taking that out and doing something more um, practical with it. Now, there's a huge amount of lawn right on the other side. So it's still going to be a lush, green, lawn-focused area of the clubhouse. This is underneath the picnic area. And we always have a little bit of erosion here. And so we have a very short-term fix that you can see, which is a waddle and some stakes there. Um, and the, because of the slope and the erosion, the lawn also looks horrible there. So again, only a very minor revision. I think maybe if we build a very small retaining wall, we re retain the majority of the lawn, um, but extend the seating area out a little bit, we'll save a little bit of water, and it'll just look better and be more functional overall. 
And then this is the approach to Hillside Clubhouse from the lower parking lot towards the pool. And I don't even think I need to say anything about this. It's just yuck. Um, I think there was lawn there before, and it's, it's sort of a back area of the clubhouse. So you know, this is something that we can discuss and figure out what kind of landscaping, if anything, we need or want to do here. But it's something that you should have on the radar. And then this area here. So again, a site of, I believe it was two very large trees that used to provide a lot of shade. And this is the lawn bowling clubhouse to the right of it in the photo. Um, and those trees came out, the lawn dried up. You know, this picture was taken like a week or two ago when the lawn should be looking its absolute best and it just looks terrible. Um, the lawn bowling club once upon a time had asked, you know, can we get a seating area put in here, some kind of shade, some kind of re-landscaping, which I think is an absolutely valid request. Um, it's not a cheap request, but something we should be considering. And then finally, this is the strip of lawn at Hillside Clubhouse that goes along Golden Rain Road. It's a nice lawn, it's in fine condition, but it's not really something that's very heavily used. So I have identified it as an opportunity for water conservation. If you look at this map, there's a some, to the bottom right hand corner of the photo, there are some trees there and underneath it is a lawn that the bowling, the lawn bowling club says that they, they use pretty often for picnics and a shady area to sit and everything. And then the red portion of the photo is the lawn that is an opportunity for water conservation. For all those people out there that are part of the lawn bowling club and we have not discussed this at length, don't worry, this is an opportunity and an idea. This is not yet a plan, just something that we're keeping everybody apprised of. Um, however, if we did choose to revise that area, um, it's about 5,600 square feet of lawn, which, which uses 170,000 gallons of water per year. So to put that in a dollar figure, it's about $1,200 worth of water a year. Um, any new landscaping is going to require water, so it's not like that cost goes away, but we will have it. So it's about a $600 savings per year. And then if we do it while East Bay Mud is still offering their rebates, it would be a $4,200 rebate, which we could put towards the cost of the project. Um, GRF also manages the parks. They're, we, there's very little to do in the parks. They're well used, people like them. We get very few complaints. Um, they're not perfect, but it's a landscape, nothing is. This park was installed by Paul Donner. It is right on the corner of Canyonwood and Tice Creek. Um, it's a gorgeous place to go, it's one of my favorites. This is the Berm Park, which is also a really, really nice park. And late last year, um, well, maybe not. Last May, I went to the Napa Iris Garden. If you guys have not been, I highly recommend you go. It's beautiful, and it's in full bloom in May. Um, so we purchased a bunch of irises from them. Irises require very little water. They go dormant in the summer, but they're beautiful in the spring. Um, so we bought a whole bunch of them, labeled them, and put them out in the ground in the berm park in an area that was previously a lawn and had been removed long ago and was just wood chips. Um, so again, this was really cost-effective to do, and Come May, we'll put a little article in the paper saying to everybody, hey, go look at the iris garden. It's going to be really pretty, blah, blah. Birdwatchers Park is on the corner of Avenida Sevilla and Tice Creek. Um, and it goes right along the creek there. Again, a really peaceful, shady little park. Nice place to walk through. Rotary Peace Park is directly across the street from Birdwatchers Park. Really nice spot. There's a history there, but I don't know it very well, so I'm not going to butcher it. Um, but I think that this was sort of there was some sort of construction project nearby and a lot of the material got stockpiled there. Is that correct, Paul? Yeah, um, and so somebody, I don't, I don't know who, Paul, did you convert this to a park? Okay, well, it was converted to a park um, and it's, again, a nice place to go and exercise. It's quite a steep slope, so walking up there will really get your heart rate up. And then finally, we managed the trails and the open spaces. So the trails, um, we have a very active trails club and they do a lot of work on the behalf of the foundation, which is excellent. However, we do maintain the trails, which means we have to go out there and make sure that the weeds are kept down um, and we do some fire abatement and we take care of trees that typically fall across the trails. Um, as I said, the trails club is very active and we now have more than nine miles of trails. And if you're a walker or if you like to be out in the hillside, I highly recommend that you go and check them out because there's just some beautiful, beautiful scenery back there. 
Meanwhile, you might remember last year I talked about how we are starting a reforestation program. This is for a few reasons. Um, over the decades or centuries even, a lot of trees were removed due to grazing and a lot of trees were limbed up and small trees removed for fire abatement purposes, which leaves us with a lot of mid to old age trees on the hillsides and very few young trees to take their place. This is a fine line to walk because we have to do this in a way that will not create a fire ladder and will not create debris to catch fire. Um, but if we space everything out properly, it's definitely achievable. And it's also important for erosion because as these trees fall over, you're losing that network of roots that hold hillsides together really well. They'll only hold hillsides together to a degree because you know roots only grow so deep, but they do a really good job of holding surface soil together. So we started this. Um, this the trees you see us planting here are larger than the ones we'll plant in the future. These are 15 gallons, and the reason for that is another project where you wouldn't have expected to budget for landscape but ended up having an impact on landscape was the solar farm. You can't imagine that putting solar panels up at the parking lot would have any impact on landscaping whatsoever, except they removed an enormous amount of eucalyptus trees there in order to create the sun for that, and the city in turn required us to replant those trees. So we were required to replant 27 trees to account for the 27 that were lost. And, and some, Jeff worked with the golf course, and they were able to account for there. And we took um, 13 of them and planted them in the open spaces. So we kind of merged those two projects, which is why the trees that are most recently planted are as big as they are. And then you can't, ooh, I was hoping you'd be able to see it a little better. You can see it on your screen. Can anybody tell me what they see there? In the black, you have to look really closely at the black. Yes. This is, we just put this owl box up this year. So this is, we put four up this January. We put four up last year. Um, as I'm sure you remember, owls are an excellent form of rodent control. They don't eat very many gophers, but they eat a whole lot of voles and moles, which are just as problematic here. So we're trying to up our owl population. Um, and this brand new box is already inhabited with all kinds of cuteness. So this makes me very, very happy. Um, and for those of you that are wondering about integrated pest management and making sure that we are not using toxic bait for rodents, which will in turn damage the owls, um, as I said, moles, I mean, owls feed primarily on moles and voles, and we use only exclusion methods for them. Um, so we don't actually use toxic bait at all for moles and voles. We do use a somewhat toxic bait for gophers. It is the lowest toxicity that we are able to get, which is still effective. And at this time, until we can complete our integrated pest management system, we still have to use that just to keep the populations under control. But this is the first step, um, one of many. And I, I think that it's very positive. And I'm just so happy to see the, the owl in there. Um, for those of you at home, in that square of blackness in the middle of the screen, there's a little barn owl. And then, of course, you know, fire is the hot topic. Um, and we are working as closely as we can with the fire department to make sure that we're doing everything within our power and within our budget to make sure that the community is as safe from fire as it possibly can be. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we've applied for grants. We've applied for grants both for the mutual and for GRF to assist in uh, doing a lot of the fire break that we're doing. The grants do not apply to annual maintenance like weed eating grasses, but they do apply to you know, once in a while maintenance things like removing flammable shrubs and limbing up trees and eliminating fire ladders. So it is a um, matched funds grant. So you have to spend to receive and it's up to $5,000, which we would hit immediately. Um, so we should be hearing back in a couple of weeks whether or not we, we got this grant or not. And then finally, we manage the medians and the color spots. The color spots, are gorgeous. This is a photo by Cassie Sewer. She's a resident here, but she also has a book called, I think, The Nature of Rossmore. And every once in a while, she sends me these beautiful photos, and they really make my day. So this is the color spot that's right on the corner of Golden Rain Road and Rossmore Parkway. We don't manage all the color spots. We only manage the ones that are on GRF property. So the ones that are along Rossmore Parkway, we manage all of those, and the ones that are in the clubhouses. There are some others that you'll see when you're driving around Rossmore that we do not manage. So there's one, um, probably the most visible one, is on the corner of Tice Creek 
and Golden Rain Road, and that is First Walnut Creek Mutual. There are some on Waterford property, there are some on, I'm sorry, not Waterford, um, some on Lakeshire property, some on Devonshire property, um, but we do the ones that are along Golden Rain Road. Um, they are water intensive, and there's been articles in the paper, you know, people saying we need to get rid of the color spots because they take a lot of water, but they are tiny areas, and they are so impactful that the amount of water that we're using to have the impact that we're having, I think, is well worth it. And then finally, the medians. These run up and down Rossmore Parkway, and they are definitely gorgeous. However, they are very high water consumers. And um, in public areas, they have required that cities can no longer have grass on medians. This is because it is almost impossible to water them without causing runoff into the street. So they're inherently a little bit wasteful. Um, so I know, has Vicki Swisher given her ad hoc technology presentation yet on water conservation? Yeah, she did. Okay, this was probably in her presentation. Um, her and I spoke, and I think that the best way to do it is to probably do this in a really gradual way, get people used to the idea. Um, if we're gonna do this, we should remove one median at a time as opposed to removing all of them at once so that the community can get on board with the idea, understand why it's necessary, and we can take measurements to see how much water we're actually saving. So the medians that are left, um, it's about one and a half acres left of grass, which is about 66,000 square feet. It's uh, two million gallons per year for these medians and about $15,000 a year in water cost. If we removed them all at once, it would be a $50,000 rebate from East Bay Mud. Um, that's not something that we're looking to do, but just so that you have some monetary figures to help in your decision-making process. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, there is a chance that Due to WELO, which is something called the Water Efficiency Landscape Ordinance, we may eventually have to take these out anyway, particularly when we enter back into a drought uh, pattern. So these are the items that I had asked you to consider. Again, just keep them on your radar for future budgeting meetings. Maybe take the sheet with you in, in September. Um, Renovation of the Hillside Clubhouse landscapes is something that will be relatively expensive. We can do some of it in-house, but some of it we can't do in-house. Um, whenever you're doing a project that has to do with a building renovation, try to set aside some money for landscape, and then just keep in mind, um, you know, plan for the long-term gradual conversion of the lawns and center medians to more drought-tolerant landscapes. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Rebecca. Carl. Yes, what do the color spots cost every year? Because you plant them twice a year. Yeah, yeah, we plant them twice a year, we maintain them, and they're usually watered every day or every other day. Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that they're about 24,000 for all said and done every year for all of them, um, but I don't know that number exactly, but that's what's in that sort of line item. So, and secondly, did you have you looked at the idea of using less still colorful, but uh, less uh, water, and maybe using annuals so you don't have to re have to go through the labor of replanting <laughs> twice and potentially something that's less water intensive. Yeah, I, I think you mean perennials, which we have looked at, and a few color spots have been converted to perennials. Um, a lot of those eventually got changed back to annuals because residents were so unhappy. Um, they th said that we thought they were second class citizens. You know, you get a, lot, a whole lot of that. So um, the difference between the annuals and the perennials is that perennials will bloom for a certain period of time, a lot of them for a very long period of time, but not year round. Um, whereas the annuals will bloom pretty much year round if we're changing them out twice a year. So um, the answer to your question is yes, we have looked into that, we've experimented with it. In some areas it is absolutely appropriate and successful, but in areas that are at, right at the entrance to Rossmore or extremely focal, um, we've gone back to annuals. One spot where we did what you are suggesting is on the corner, we call it three corners. It's the corner of Terra Granada, Rossmore Parkway, and Paul? What's the third street? Well, anyway, if you go all the way up Rossmore Parkway, there you go. 
So Tice Creek, Terra Granada, and Rossmore Parkway, there's a little corner there with some olive trees in it that used to be all annuals. Now it's primarily perennials with just a few annuals in there. And certain times of the year, it looks absolutely beautiful, and other times of the year, it, it just doesn't look very good. Sue? Rebecca, I really hate to bring this up, <laughs> but I have, especially for my friends who have pets who claim that there's a problem with their paws, can we talk a little bit about Roundup? Yes, I meant to bring that up. Can we manage the GRF landscapes organically? The answer is yes, but we need the labor and the funds to do it. So I'm happy to implement that as soon as we have one more uh, technician and a slightly increased materials cost because the organic materials are more expensive than Roundup. Thank you. Sure. Ken? How much help or staff do you have dedicated to GF property only? Seven. So the second slide here. So it's five landscape techs, one irrigation technician, and one supervisor. Carl? Yes, I know that some of the mutuals have problems with the seed pods and, you know, causing trip hazards. Do we have any trees that have that sort of situation on GRF property? That's a good question. I can't imagine that we don't. Our biggest offender is the liquid amber tree, which is a big, beautiful tree. It has great fall color, but they drop these seed pods year round and people trip on them inevitably every year. Um, there's very little we can do about it. We've tried anti-fruiting treatments that don't work. Um, and in some cases, we've asked the city if we can remove them because they've caused so many problems, and the answer is no. Um, so the answer to your question is there are not any that I can think of on GRF property that are particularly problematic, but the trees that you're referring to are liquid ambers, usually. I have a question. Um, I walk my dog every day up. Tice Creek Drive, and there's one spot where you've planted narcissus, and I know you have to worry about uh, drought tolerant, deer tolerant, and all, and I'm just wondering, that's one of my favorite spots because it's just so fragrant there, and I'm wondering why you don't use that more off in more places. Um, Rich planted a lot of those, and everybody loves them. The daffodils are extremely popular. But I would ask that question again in about three months, because what happens is they're beautiful right now, and then the leaves start to lose, you know, once they're done flowering, you have to let the leaves go dormant. You can't cut them off, or it, they won't derive the nutrients back into the bulb. So we go through this long period of time with this sort of dead grass-looking thing all over the place. So keep that question in mind, and let's bring it back up in the middle of summer. Okay, well, I, I still think it's worth it in other fragrant plants. So, but I want to get to my more important comment. Um, I, I just want to say you guys do a great job because the most common remark I hear when visitors come to visit me is how fantastic Rossmore looks. So, Thank you. And what I'm shocked about is that I'm looking at this capital projects budget and there's not one landscaping item on there. And I think we need to figure out a better... You're talking about keeping money aside for landscaping and all, but it seems like we're, I'm gonna ask you to be a little more um, uh, proactive, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. to be a little more demonstrative and get some of your landscape projects on their capital budgets list because if we don't see it on the list, we don't really discuss it. Sure. We don't really evaluate it. So I think that's, I don't know exactly where it's falling down in the, in the, the organization, but I'd like to see you uh, put those on the list. I, I saw you had a list at the end there of some things to consider, but I, I'd like to see a, um, you know, some regular yearly proposal with pictures and discussion of what you want to do. I think that would help a lot. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, Hillside is obviously first on the agenda and I think the most urgent, um, but some other projects that I know Tim has you know, talked about in the past, right as you come in Rossmore, that corner of the golf course that they have abandoned because it's this really water thirsty lawn and something that they're not really interested in maintaining is the perfect spot for an entry monument, flowery type of situation there and maybe a path or whatever. So I can certainly put that on. Um, and the other thing that I always daydream about doing, and I know it's been on Paul's list and I think it's been on Tim's list also, that. is a pathway 
that will go through the landscape in the parts of the golf course that the golf course wishes to abandon because they're expensive for them to maintain. Um, you know, every Monday, there's tons of people walking out on the golf course. Imagine if you could have that to a smaller degree every single day. It'd be fantastic. So um, yeah, that's a very long-term issue, but I'm happy to put that all down on paper. Maybe we can start saving away for stuff like that. Well, I know you probably have something internally, but I'd like to see you uh, update the board on maybe a five-year plan with the broken down yearly, sort of like we do for our trust estate fund projections. This could be our landscape projections, and it should be incorporated, I think, uh, regularly in our budget discussions. So okay. other questions? I'd love Les, to. And then Steve. I would like to second what Bob just said, that uh, the only item in terms of landscaping that came up originally was the, that corner you're talking about, the monument corner, and that uh, didn't get much uh, support, uh, but it wasn't talked about very much. So I, I would recommend that you make some proposals to the board when it comes to budget time to put, you on, put something on the list from that. In, in addition, I wanted to support your color spots because I get considerable comments about people who say how beautiful it is to come in and how nice that looks. So I would really hate to see the color spots go away. I agree. Steve. I'd like to uh, add my support to that concept and I, I think it's actually perfectly fitting that uh, those sorts of expectations and uh, real maintenance issues be reviewed from a capital budget perspective. Several people, not again, uh, uh, again today, uh, the bathrooms in Rothmore were mentioned. They don't seem to get the attention without someone on staff raising them as a perpetual interest and expectation of our residents. I absolutely agree with your point on the landscaping, but there are other uh, concepts that are just not included. They're not discussed. Barbara. I'd just like to um, say that I hope the medians or would be included in whatever you would present for budget. Sure, yeah. Other questions of Rebecca or comments? Thank you. Thank you. So now we're gonna hear from Ken Anderson. Uh, he's passionate about landscape as well, so we're gonna get a little presentation from Ken. Chance to. <clears throat> Good morning. The purpose of my presentation this morning is to identify a few areas in GRF landscaping that may prove to be a problem in the near or far future. Um, first of all, the most serious one of which I think is our eight sequoia trees that were incorrectly planted. Uh, the only other and most immediate and emergency uh, problem is the erosion on Tyus Creek I'll get to in a moment. But there, of all the problem areas that I found, the only one that I think is serious is the seven or the eight sequoia trees. None of this is to diminish that we have a very beautiful landscape here in Rossmore. It is gorgeous and it has been for quite a while. Um, Aim it behind you. And this beautiful landscape is thanks to MOD's uh, mm -hmm. and point it at the screen. Oh, okay. Just right. keep holding it, yeah. All right, thank you. <clears throat> we switched to a cursor as a pointing device so that both people could see the board members who are looking at this screen and the uh, audience who are looking at this screen can see both of them at the same time. Um, <clears throat> But 
the MOD uh, Landscape and Committee and the uh, many mutual landscape committees have done a wonderful job to create this beautiful landscape. But errors are natural and naturally occurring. For example, the, by far the most serious problem is the erosion on Tice Creek um, at the, whoops, <laughs> it's not, is the Buckeye tennis, uh, sorry, the pickleball courts at Creekside. And the, um, this is not, do you have a laser pointer? Uh, it blacks out everything. And the erosion by Tice Creek Road over there by the Buckeye uh, uh, tennis courts. That is the most serious, and, and the board is already doing as much as they can, as fast as they can, to get this done. I believe we're going to get the report for the, uh, how the solution in May, and then we have to put it out to bid, and hopefully we'll have the erosion control uh, fixed before the rains next winter. One of the trees is that there are a few spots in which there are too many trees were pointed too close together. Uh, another problem area is the wrong tree selection for the wrong areas. For example, these uh, eight redwood trees here up by uh, Hillside parking lot uh, that leads to the swimming pool, uh, were planted in a row in front of this beautiful oak um, hillside uh, uh, hill behind it. Oaks need a hot and dry environment, whereas, <clears throat> whereas redwoods need a cool and wet environment. These are not environmentally or aesthetically compatible. Some alignments of trees, it's, it's not a naturally occurring thing, but sometimes they are appropriate. For example, here, we see this border, and they're quite appropriate here. And besides, they have a clear view underneath the, the branches to provide a, a view through the open space behind it. So this, is, this one is good. But many, another problem is that we should continue to do more about water intensive trees and plants, replacing them, not always, but sometimes, uh, with, and replace them with native drought tolerant, fire retardant plant life. And this is according to our general plan, uh, chapter four, environment uh, dash three. Now, <clears throat> Paul Donner, uh, Rich Perona, and now Rebecca uh, Pollan have done a great deal in this area 20 years before it was popular. Rich Perona has taken out a lot of lawns and somewhat inconspicuous spaces, leaving those that are more profiled and seen by the public out front. But a lot has already been done about this, and I just think we'd like to see more done. Now, my main contention are these eight redwood trees. There's called sequoias, uh, soquel sequoias, one of my favorite trees. I had nine of them in my yards in uh, my previous home. The most important error or incorrection or mistake or whatever you want to call it is that these were planted for one tree and one tree only according to Rich Verona and that is to provide shade for cars in the parking lot and the problem is that sequoia trees are conical in shape they are not a shade tree they're the opposite of a shade tree they're they're very narrow at the top providing very little shade there's no see-through uh, view of the space behind them versus a shade tree, which grows up and spreads out, providing maximum shade, has a see-through uh, view at the bottom, and they're deciduous trees. They drop their leaves, allowing what little warmth a winter sun will provide. Redwoods are also water-intensive. Uh, they're bur best and serve, occur naturally in areas that have 41 to 100 inches of rain in a year. Walnut Creek barely gets 23 years. Maybe to this year is an exception. Um, therefore, these redwood trees have to get their uh, water from not only sprinklers, but also the water table. They also have a shallow root system. Um, planted next to a parking lot. That's not a problem now, but it could very well be in the future. I want to point out something else, too, that's very interesting. Look at the way the shadows go. They look like they're pointed in the right direction, right? That's going to provide shade. 
a skinny little shade in the parking lot. However, this picture was taken two weeks ago in the late afternoon. And you can see by the shadow that the sun is setting over here in the southwest corner. These shadows will not be there in the summertime. The sun will, in the summertime, when you need the shade the most, the sun is going to rise. I'm sorry, the <laughs> board cannot see this. That's all right. Beg pardon? OK. <laughs> the sun will rise in the southeast, no, I'm sorry, the northeast in the summertime, arch up and over, and at zenith, will cast a shadow straight down, providing very little or no shadow, and then arc, continue to arc over to the northwest in which case the shadows will be pointing also in the hillside. Uh, so, you know, I doubt now that they will ever provide any sufficient shade. Also, redwood trees drop tannic acid. This is <laughs> a big problem. They can, they can drop it now when they're small with wind, but they won't even need wind later. These little red spots are very hard to remove, remove from car paint. And uh, they're especially hard at convertibles, especially convertibles with leather seats. These eight sequoia trees were planted in direct violation of three of our policies in our general plan. Open space landscape 2.1 says we are to enhance views of Rossmore's open spaces. Look at, look at this hillside, this beautiful oak woodland hillside. Uh, for, this is the parking lot leading up to the swimming pool of hillside. And these trees, trees are <coughs> already beginning to block that nice view. Kind of scraggly, too, the, some of these uh, redwood trees. I'm very unusual. But this is a beautiful view that these will obstruct. At maturity, these trees will block that view entirely. Open Space Landscape 2.3 says that we are to ensure that new uses of GRS open space do not detract from the overall attractiveness of open space. I think these redwood trees will do that. The goal of Chapter 5 is uh, OSL-4 says that we are to prioritize landscaping throughout Rossmore that provides natural beauty and is both durable and environmentally fr friendly. There is nothing natural or friendly <coughs> about a screen of redwood trees blocking a beautiful view. There is some urgency here because we need to act before the tree trunks get to be nine inches in diameter when measured four and a half feet above the ground. Once that happens, we need the city's permission. Walnut Creek has to give us permission and it's very hard to do. The trees are now six to seven inches in diameter and we have maybe one or two years uh, to get that done, if we choose to do something about it. The bottom line is that these redwoods provide little or no shade and will certainly obstruct, obstruct a beautiful woodland view for, for many decades to come. To do nothing is to ignore this growing problem that's only going to get worse. One possible solution, I, I proposal that I was going to make in the future, is to take out these eight sequoia trees and plant a few shade trees or shrubs that would not block the open uh, woodland view of the hill. However, now, after thinking about the arc of the sun, what the sun does during the, the summertime, I don't think anything is going to provide shade at that spot for cars in that parking lot, especially when we need it. So in, in conclusion, I would like to point out that these are not just my ideas at all, but I've been um, supported uh, in its entirety by four architect landscape, one of which, Bob, is Bob Haas still here? One of, one of which um, was a former editor of two uh, landscape publications and an expert on native uh, planting. Um, the board has already read his, his, his letter, but I would just mention his, four, his conclusions. First, he said, I agree 100% that those redwoods should never have been planted. Redwoods are never used primarily as a shade tree. 
Redwoods are never found in oak woodlands. Trying to justify keeping them misses the point entirely. Planting them in a row was an obvious landscaping faux pas. Uh, that's something landscapers are taught to avoid. Trees usually never grow in a row. Sometimes it might be appropriate, or we might choose to ignore that because it, it's a border. Uh, not true in this case, I don't think. Uh, we should not compromise and only remove some of them. Doing so ignores the reasons that they are incompatible with their location. <clears throat> so these are the conclusions of a foremost uh, landscape uh, architect. Uh, any questions? If it's technical, I have a landscape artist here with me <laughs> that I can avail. But uh, on sequoia trees, uh, uh, I feel fairly Mine's confident. real basic. I'm taking the thunder away from Mary. You have any idea what the cost of this will be? I'm going to uh, ask the staff to come back <laughs> next week. With We're not going to take any action today on this. So I'm going to ask the staff to come back next month with that. So we can. No, we're not doing anything today. Any day until we know what the cost right. is. We'll do that. Any other questions or comments? OK, thank you. Thank you. So you. as I mentioned, we're not going to take any action today on this. Normally, the board wouldn't get involved in sort of detailed landscape issues like this. But since we're talking about cutting down trees, I think it's appropriate that the residents get an opportunity to uh, hear about it and weigh in on it. Um, so I will ask the staff to come back next month with their um, some cost estimates for that and we'll have a discussion and and maybe we'll have a decision on that next month and I urge the board members to go out and look at it uh, I did yesterday and um, I have to agree even though I wasn't uh, terribly uh, invested in this project but when I looked at it yesterday I have to agree with uh, what Ken is saying. So I urge other board members to go out and take a look at them. Bob? Ken? I would like to make a motion that we form an ad hoc committee of volunteers to do exactly what you said, in addition to the staff, of uh, people who would like to volunteer for an ad hoc committee uh, to study this area and report back at the uh, April 25th meeting. Uh, I don't think we really need that at this point and uh, wasn't on the agenda, so I don't really think we need, I think just if the board members go out and look and if the staff comes back with estimates that we should be able to make, and we've heard from the landscape architects and if you get other people who want to come back, I think that's adequate. Point of order, Mr. President. The motion has been made and we're waiting for a second. Okay, is there a second to the motion? Hearing no second, uh, motion dies. Okay, so we're gonna move forward now and talk about, uh, we have, uh, actually signing the contracts. We've uh, approved the money for the uh, repaving in our capital budget motion we made earlier. However, now we have some specific contracts that we're talking about signing. So I'd like to hear a motion about the uh, paving contracts. Uh, I'll make the motion if you like, but I'm confused. It seems that the motion should uh, indicate we're giving authority to the CEO to execute the contract. We've already approved the funds. Is yeah, that it correct? says it says that on it says um, consider approving expenditure of up to one hundred and fourteen thousand from the operating budget and expenditure of five hundred twenty thousand right. from the trust fund. Uh, da da da. The CEO to execute the contracts with Silicon Valley Silicon Silicon Valley Paving Inc. for street maintenance. Okay, so the money has already been approved prior to this. Do we want the money included in this motion? That's the question, yes? Well, I think it's just being specific. Okay, I'll be specific. I move that we approve an expenditure of up to 114000 from the operating budget and an expenditure up to $520,000 from the trust estate funds and authorize the CEO to execute the contracts with Silicon Valley Paving, Inc. for street maintenance. Okay, we have a second. I see what you mean now, because it sounds like we haven't already approved right. the money. So, um, we've approved it twice. We'll approve it twice. Okay, any discussion on this? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that's passed. Um, there will not be a mid-month regular meeting of the board in April. The next end-of-month meeting will be 
here on Thursday, April 25th at 9 a.m. Uh, there will be an executive session after this, so we're in recess. Thank you.